So now that we have seen that uh, you have forces pulling in different directions in physics, let's just look a little bit more again at morality. Suppose we have a situation like um, I agree to uh, meet you for coffee at uh, 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Okay, so I make a promise. All right, when I make that promise, that creates an obligation on me, according to Ross. And that obligation is a duty. That obligation is like a force on me. So uh, that, per, that, that promise is like a force pulling me to have coffee with you tomorrow. Uh, what should I do? Well, I should, instead of, you know, in physics, we don't talk about what should the ball do, it's what will it do. But here we're talking about what should we do. Well, in this sense, uh, what should I do? I should have coffee with you. But suppose uh, that uh, something else comes up, namely, again, standard uh, clash of duties, that in addition to having an obligation now that I've created, I've also got an obligation, it turns out, to take my mother to the doctor tomorrow at 10 a.m. I promise to come to coffee with you at 10 a.m., but I also have, oh, it turns out, an obligation to take my mother to the doctor at 10 a.m. So I've got a couple of forces on me. So I've got the obligation of a uh, uh, of a promise and the, the duty uh, and obligation to mom. Okay, so that promise, I have the coffee, the coffee promise and the obligation uh, to take my mom to the, uh, to the doctor. So um, how should we uh, figure this out? Well, Analogous, not identically, but analogously to the situation in science, you try to put them together the best you can. Now, it's these ones can be uh, uh, put together in various ways where they have parts of them integrated into each other, and that's why you can get uh, this sort of resolution like this. But here, Ross says, well, look, we kind of do the same thing. We're, we're pulled in different directions, and we make judgments as to what the resolution of the conflicting duty should be. We do this all the time. So we recognize that it is the case that you, it is certainly a moral truth that you should, uh, when you make when you make a promise, you yes, you create uh, an obligation on yourself and you should fulfill that obligation. If you have a, uh, if you have a mom, then Ross would say, well, you have a duty to her and you should fulfill that. So we can be as we were absolutists about science, scientific principles, even when they clash, we put them together, we can still be absolutists. Again, you got to read that with a kind of qualified sense. So absolutists about moral principles too. It doesn't mean that you don't have any of these, these duties, but you put them together as well. How do you do that? Well, you are looking at the large situation, just like you're looking at the, the whole situation, the large situation, like the entirety of the situation in both cases in order to figure out where the ball will go and what you should do. So in that sense, duties um, are a lot like forces in physics. They come in clusters. That's what life is like. And Ross offers some, some interesting uh, observations on this that, you know, duties always come in groups. You're, it's rare that you ever just have a situation where you have only one duty imposed on you, most of life is you have several duties. And these are what he calls prima facie duties imposed on you. So life is like this nexus of you're constantly wandering around like the sphere is in the universe. It's played on, uh, played upon by dozens of different forces all over the place. We are like walking through, a, 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 you know, fields of different morals, moral laws pulling on us. So it's the same idea. So he thinks there is an analogy here. So that's the way you think of life, according to Ross, is you've constantly got moral obligations. They're pulling you in different directions. And like the little sphere, you resolve them into what you're going to do. That's where you're thinking about morality and resolving things. And while well, I'm not going to, you know, I, yeah, I'm, instead of uh, make, keeping my promise to you, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, go and take my mom and then maybe I might try and well I'm going to try and uphold my promise in a different way I'll give you a call after I'm done with with mom or something like that so this is how we put things together in this uh, moral universe so duties are analogous to forces they come in clusters and we resolve them in order to figure out what we should do now again it's an analogy not an identity 
uh, in that, as I said uh, earlier, you can calculate things exactly in science, right? That's the beauty of science is, is you can calculate these things and there's one and only one answer. Ross has a certain view of what science is. He thinks science tells us the way the universe works, the truth about things. Science is a way to get deep into the truth of the universe and to get exact uh, uh, answers to things. Morality is not quite like that. He thinks morality is a lot like science in the sense of we're trying to do the same thing here, uh, over here, as we do there. We're resolving our duties in a certain, in, in a certain way, but we can't calculate. In, in this sense, our, our, like we might have you know, very clear, self-evident uh, notions of duties, like you know, you should keep your promises. That's like a moral principle that Ross thinks is uh, is self-evident and absolute, right? There's no 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 doubt that that is true. That you should keep your promises. You should uh, uh, work to bring more knowledge into the world or more goodness. These things Ross thinks are moral principles that are self-evident. But even though you have self-evident principles like uh, you know do your uh, you know discharge your obligation towards your mom and uh, you know, keep your promises, even though those moral principles are true, they're self-evident, in that sense, they're like science. What we can't do uh, uh, exactly like science is calculate the answer, right? There is an answer, Ross thinks, but we can't ever calculate it in the way that we can calculate science, scientific uh, uh, answers and be absolutely certain of the results. We can't do that, that's moral life. And so in this sense, um, our judgments, uh, uh, um, you know, about what our prima facie duties that we're facing, the judgment about that that nexus or that group of them, that could be completely accurate. It's all clear moral principles. But what the resolution of it should be, Ross doesn't think we can really know that. So you've got a level of self uh, uh, evidence, you know, self evident propositions uh, up here in terms of judging what the moral situation is but the resolution of it is not self-evident. So if it's not done by calculation, like in physics, it's not a logical deduction. Oh, you have all these things and then you just, you know, do a logical inference to get out what you should do of all the duties that are uh, uh, upon you. How do we make these decisions then? So, so let's dig a little bit more into what does Ross think we're doing when we actually move from the, dis the, the description of the set of obligations in a certain situation to the resolution. Here, it's calculation. Here, it's not calculation. Um, in logic, it would be a logical inference. Again, it's not a logical inference here. What is it? Well, Ross um, says that it, it's, uh, it's like examining a piece of poetry to uh, conclude that that piece of poetry is beautiful. So he likens the inference made in this situ in the moral situation is more like a judgment in aesthetics, in art. So we could all agree on various principles in art about, uh, you know, symmetric forms are beautiful, okay? We might agree that certain kinds of lyrical constructions and, and patterns are beautiful. So we might have aesthetic principles that we agree, and then we bring them to a given poem or a given work of art. And then we say, well, with all of our self-evident principles of art, can we conclude that this particular piece of art is beautiful because it may have some of the things that some of the principles may apply, some might pull in different directions. So again, Ross is uh, you know, trying to develop analogies with, uh, with science and art. He thinks that a lot of these things are quite similar. So he's got a large scale epistemology in the background about our reasoning about things uh, is uh, quite similar in many ways. We start off with an insight into certain principles, but the results of combining those principles is done in different ways. It's done one way in science, it's done a different way in art and morality. And so what we, uh, we might say that the piece of poetry pulls me in various ways um, and some would lead me towards thinking it's beautiful. Some might not. I mean, well, it's beautiful in the sense that it's got a lovely rhythm, but it might be sad, et cetera, et cetera. So there could be a variety of ways that would pull me in, or sorry, a variety of directions that the piece of poem, that the piece of poetry would pull me. 
Um, but it's not a logical inference to say, oh, therefore it's, it, it's beautiful or not. Um, so there's self-evident principles, then there's this artistic uh, uh, judgment. So there's truths, lots of, uh, lots of truths that we have access to, but what we deduce with those truths, how we apply them in, the, in our given lives, well, that's different. That's, a, that's more of a term of art, unless you're doing actual uh, science. Now, keep in mind, though, you, you should not read Ross as, as, you know, being mystical about these kinds of truths, uh, moral truths and aesthetic truths, you know, truths of aesthetic truths about symmetry or moral truths about keeping your promises. He thinks that we learn those in a very similar way to how we learn mathematics. So all these kinds of truths that are up here, right, and that we then apply um, we learn those truths through experience. And he says, think about, you know, something like one plus one equals two, right? That's a truth. You didn't know that when you were born, though. So in this sense, Ross is very much an empiricist, you know, in the Locke, in the John Locke type tradition. You learn that through experience, but just because you learned it through experience, that doesn't mean it's a contingency of experience. Like you learned through experience that, uh, uh, you know, that, I don't know, through experience, you see that this little mark is on the board, right? But I can get rid of it, right? That's easy. So it's an empirical truth. Well, it was that that mark was on the board. So, but it's also an empirical truth in the sense that I can get rid of it. You learned this one through experience, right? Your, some teacher taught it to you, no doubt. Um, but you can't get rid of it. Right? You can't just say, oh, I'm going to erase this. And that gets rid of the equation. One plus one is equal to two. So in other words, there are truths that we learn through experience that are themselves not dependent on experience, right? So even if there weren't any human experience, it would still be the case that one plus one is equal to true. It is equal to two. Now that is a certain position that Ross is taking, and many philosophers have taken that with respect to mathematics. Not all, right? That is a question. That is a debatable position. But for Ross, he thinks there are logical truths about the universe. They're built right into the fabric. There are arithmetic truths. There are scientific truths. And there are moral truths. There are artistic truths. So principles of aesthetics, principles of morality. They are, he says, built right, just like science, right into the fabric of, uh, of the universe. We don't know them from birth. We don't know one plus one is equal to two from birth. We learn it when our mind has developed uh, and is mature enough. Same thing about aesthetic truths. Same thing about moral truths we learn over time. In earlier video, I talked about Ross talking about generations even learning. So things that come that are not evident to earlier uh, generations can be evident later on. So there's moral progress. Again, so there's moral progress across generations. There's moral progress in the individual as well. Okay, so it, 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 what's important now is that the action that we take after we've resolved all of our duties and we've made that, shall we say, that kind of artistic inference, um, that is basically our duty in the end, right? That becomes sort of like the main actual proper uh, duty. So your prima facie duties are the individual ones that pull you in different directions. You can think of your actual uh, proper duty as the one that's the resolution uh, of them all. But again, we can't be sure. We just do our best. Ross says in various places, you cannot absolutely be sure what your final actual proper duty is. There is a real true answer, but that one is not self-evident. We just do our best. Just like whether or not a piece of poetry truly is beautiful um, is, is a fully objective question. There is a truth to that. We do our best to try and get at it, but we can never be sure we're right. But sciences and logic, that's different. We can get the right answer uh, on that one. So in this whole discussion, he thinks that, uh, you know, the distinction um, of the so-called clash of duties, Ross says, that's a pseudo 
problem. It's not a real problem if you recognize that duties are like these little forces pulling us, prima facie duties, little forces pulling, and that they can be resolved into a, 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 an act of duty that takes account of everything. This is giving us a hint at what makes a right act right. It's going to be some sort of summation that applies to the whole situation, that applies to the act, that shows that there's really no such thing as this absolute clash, this paralyzing clash of duties. No, that was only when you were absolute, but uh, about principles that you didn't allow of them to be merged with others. But that would be like Newton saying, well, you know, gravity cannot be, uh, you cannot combine, you know, a situation where there's gravity and, and magnetism. I mean, there's all kinds of forces that could be acting on something. You have to take them all into account. Well, if that's how it works in physics, it's not a surprise that Ross says that's how it works in ethics without making gravity false or that it's false that you have to keep your promises.